diplopia. This presentation will cover an overview on diplopia, classification and etiology of diplopia, evaluation in terms of history and examination, some examples of third, fourth, and sixth nerve palsies, as well as myasthenia gravis, muscle and orbital problems that result in diplopia, and a summary of the presentation. Diplopia is a symptom of seeing two images of an object and can be either monocular or binocular. Monocular diplopia is defined as double vision that persists despite occlusion of the second eye, while binocular diplopia is a condition where the double vision is obliterated upon occlusion of the second eye. Monocular diplopia occurs from problems of the ocular surface, which could be either astigmatic in nature from a refractive error, corneal scars and irregularities, or lenticular problems such as cataract. Binocular diplopia is usually neurological. It can be due to effects of the neuromuscular junction such as myasthenia gravis, or problems with the extraocular muscles, or lesions in the orbit such as thyroid eye disease, myositis, orbital fractures, tumors, etc. When assessing for diplopia, history is essential. History helps to point towards a probable diagnosis in most cases. When asking history from a patient with diplopia, one must check whether the diplopia is horizontal, vertical or oblique, in which direction of gaze it occurs or is worst, what the onset and progression of diplopia was like, if it was acute or chronic, which gives a clue as to the etiology, and if it's worsening or improving. Variability is a critical question to ask in patients with diplopia. A lot of patients with diplopia have underlying myasthenia and it gives a clue as to fatigability as well. Ask about other ophthalmic problems, just pain in or around the eye, as well as associated drooping of the eyelids. Neurological symptoms are important in terms of weakness, numbness and headaches, which may point to a more systemic problem of which diplopia is one symptom. Past medical and surgical history, including medications, must be asked for, and a family history as well. When examining a patient with diplopia, there are a few key features that must be kept in mind. Abnormal head posture, presence of ptosis, involvement of the pupil, what the extraocular movements are like, if the orbit is within normal limits, if there are any other cranial nerves involved, and systemic examination as suggested by the history and examination. Abnormal head posture in patients with diplopia usually occurs in the direction of limitation. For example, in a six nerve palsy, the patient turns his face towards the side of the palsy. In a fourth nerve palsy, the patient will turn his, will tilt his head away from the side of the fourth nerve palsy. In a bilateral fourth nerve palsy, the patient adopts a chin down posture and in bilateral ptosis, the patient adopts a chin up posture in order to be able to overcome the ptosis. When examining for ptosis, first look to see if the ptosis is unilateral or bilateral. Measure the palpable aperture and the margin reflex distance or MRD1 which is the distance from the corneal light reflex to the upper lid margin. Assess for fatigability and variability. Signs of myasthenia such as a lash sign, an eye peak sign, Kogan's lid twitch and orbicularis strength are useful clues to detect and diagnose myasthenia. Common etiologies where you might see a third nerve palsy or myasthenia gravis are conditions where double vision coexists with ptosis. Pupil examination is important in a patient with double vision. To look to see if the pupil size is the same in both eyes and if there is an isochoria if it's worse in the light or dark. Also assess whether the direct reflex is sluggish and if a consensual response is present. Look for light near dissociation and look for pupil constriction and induction. Common etiologies that might present with double vision as well as pupil abnormalities are a third nerve palsy which may involve the pupil or which may be associated with aberrant regeneration. Rarely, Horner's syndrome may coexist with multiple cranial nerve palsies as well. Examination of the extraocular movements must begin with a cover-uncover test as well as an alternate cover test. 
This helps to pick up subtle abnormalities that may not be visual, visible in examination of the extraocular movements per se. If a tropia or euphoria is detected on the cover on cover test, this might be measured with prisms. Subsequently, examine the extraocular movements in nine cardinal positions of gaze, and both versions, which is binocular, and ductions, which is monocular, must be assessed. Also, look to see what the patient's pursued and saccadic movements are like. Pursuit is when the patient follows a target slowly, and saccadic movements are when the patient rapidly looks to a target on one side or the other. Any extraocular movement limitation with lid retraction or globe retraction are clues to other pathologies such as duanes or conditions such as paranoids where there's lid retraction. If there are duction problems, then consider examining further for whether they might be restrictive of paretic. And if there are version problems, look to see for patterns such as internuclear ophthalmoplegia or INO and one and a half syndromes. Subsequent to this, one must examine the orbit because orbital problems can also result in double vision when there is no neurological issue. <clears throat> Proptosis, using a Hertel's ectophthalmometer, look to see if it's axial or non-axial. Lid lag, lid retraction, lag of thalmos, conjunctival injection and chemosis, all of which are clues to an orbital problem which may be congestive or inflammatory. Most common etiologies include orbital trauma, orbital tumors, thyroid eye disease, carotid cavernous fistula, etc. Other cranial nerve examination is important to localize a pathology intracranially if there are multiple cranial nerves involved. Optic nerve examination with visual acuity, color vision, confrontation visual feeds, and looking for a relative afferent pupillary defect is critical. In addition, examine for the trigeminal nerve, for the facial nerve, as well as for the vestibular cochlear nerve. Combination of involvement of these nerves along with double vision can point to a lesion intracranially and different patterns of combinations can point to the exact location of these lesions. For example, if there's a lesion in the orbital apex, the second and the third cranial nerves along with the fourth and V1 branch of trigeminal may be involved. If there's a lesion in the superior orbital fissure, the third, fourth, and sixth nerves may be involved along with V1. Cavernous sinus lesions will classically present with third, fourth, sixth nerve involvement, V1 and V2 involvement, as well as Horner syndrome, etc. This is an example of a patient with a third cranial nerve palsy, which, if the pupil is involved, needs urgent neuroimaging to exclude life threatening causes. Most commonly, Pupil involvement of the third nerve palsy must prompt investigation for an aneurysm, usually from the posterior communicating artery. In addition, uncle herniation from raised intracranial pressure can also cause a third cranial nerve palsy. It's important to distinguish between an ischemic and a compressive third cranial nerve palsy because of the prognosis and the sinister nature of the lesion in a compressive third cranial nerve palsy, which may be life threatening. Classically, patients with ischemic third nerve palsies are older, they have multiple vascular risk factors. The pupil is usually spared, although it can in a small percentage of patients be involved. There should not be any signs of aberrant regeneration, and these ischemic palsies usually recover within about three months. Compressive third nerve palsy, on the other hand, occurs in younger patients who do not have any vascular risk factors, and the pupil is usually involved. They may or may not have signs of aberrant regeneration, and they usually do not demonstrate recovery with time. A cranial nerve fourth palsy can present with oblique or vertical diplopia. These patients may present with an abnormal head posture, such as a compensatory head tilt to the contralateral shoulder. This palsy can be diagnosed with the park bilcharsky three-step test, which involves performing a cover test in primary position with face turn on either side and with head tilt on either side. The fourth cranial nerve palsy can either be congenital or acquired. A acquired fourth cranial nerve palsy can result as a result of closed head trauma or ischemia and rarely compressive lesions. The fourth cranial nerve palsy has various sites of susceptibility in trauma intracranially, and uh, the, these include exit from the dorsal aspect of the midbrain, usually bilateral, 
or where it lies just medial to the free edge of the tentorium cerebelli. The sixth cranial nerve palsy causes horizontal binocular diplopia, which is worse on ipsilateral gaze, and the common etiologies include ischemia, tumors, particularly nasopharyngeal carcinoma, which is common in Southeast Asia, and trauma. It is extremely important to rule out raised intracranial pressure in these patients, which can result in a sixth nerve palsy being a false localizing sign. And this happens due to compression and stretching of the sixth cranial nerve along the sharp edge of the petrous temporal bone. Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disorder where antibodies against acetylcholine postsynaptic receptors result in impaired transmission at the neuromuscular junction. This therefore results in variable muscle weakness and fatigue. If this involves only the ocular muscles, it can mimic a pupil sparing third nerve palsy, a fourth or a sixth cranial nerve palsy, and the EOM limitation do not follow a specific cranial nerve pattern. It may or may not present with ptosis as well. However, more significantly, patients with myasthenia gravis can have generalized myasthenia, which is life-threatening, can result in respiratory distress, dysphagia and dysphonia, as well as proximal muscle weakness. So it becomes critical for the ophthalmologist or someone examining the eyes of a patient with double vision to ensure that they pick up myasthenia as the risk of generalization must be prevented. Orbital and muscular causes can also cause double vision, for example, with orbital trauma and entrapment of, of muscles, thyroid eye disease, chronic progressive external ophthalmopedia, myotonic dystrophy, and orbital myositis, all of which are conditions which through various processes of either inflammation or trauma or compression result in abnormal movement of eyes, globe displacement, and diplopia. In summary, when examining a patient with double vision, begin by ensuring that the double vision is binocular, meaning it is eliminated by monocular occlusion before considering neurological causes. History of onset, progression, direction of diplopia, and variability of symptoms is essential in direct the diagnosis. Cover test in different directions of gaze can pick up subtle lesions even when extraocular movements are apparently normal. Examination of adjacent cranial nerves helps localize the lesion intracranially when multiple cranial nerves are involved. Remember to examine the orbit and consider diagnosis of myasthenia, particularly if pattern is not suggestive of a single cranial nerve lesion. And finally, consider sinister intracranial causes if the pupil is involved if there are multiple cranial nerves involved, if you see a sixth cranial nerve palsy in a young patient, or if there's progressive worsening of diplopia in presumed ischemic palsies. Thank you.